Do you get mom anxiety worrying about your infant hitting developmental milestones? Today, you're going to meet Dr. Shannon Davis, aka Dr. Shannon PT. She's a physical therapist, mother of two girls, nine and 11, and a business owner, and inventor of the little balance box and hativity. Join us for our chat about developmental milestones. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momsiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Hey, Ma, did you know that there's a Momsiety Club membership? When you join, you'll get access to a wonderfully supportive group of moms where you can ask whatever questions or just vent if that's what you need. There's also weekly exercise classes to give your body and mind a little boost so you are refreshed for the rest of the week. And if you can't make it live, you can get access to all the replays in the members area. If you're listening to this podcast, I'm confident that it's a fit for you. To make it accessible for everyone, it's less than $10 a month. Plus, throughout the month of December, the cost of membership for all new moms to join the Momsiety Club will be donated to the Children's Miracle Network. I'm extending you this offer to join other moms like you around the world saying goodbye to their Momsiety together. Just head to join.momsietyclub.com and click the Join the Momsiety Club membership. I can't wait to see you there. Hey, Mama. Welcome to episode 20 of the Momsiety Club podcast. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, however you were able to celebrate or not. Are you in full holiday swing now, or have you been in swing for a bit now? As I'm recording this, my oldest is anxiously waiting to decorate for Hanukkah. We talked about it last night, and the first words out of his mouth this morning were, I can't wait to decorate when we get home from school, which was just adorable. In the Momsiety Club membership, several mamas have shared some photos of their little ones for Thanksgiving, shared activities for older children to do with their families during the holiday season, as well as some have shared that they put up their Christmas decorations even earlier in November just to bring a little extra joy to their houses during this crazy time that we're living in. Last week's episode was about gratitude since it was Thanksgiving last week as well as realistic self-care, and I challenged you to start a gratitude journal. Were you able to write down one thing each day? I have to be honest, I did not. I did think about something I was grateful for, um, or one of my favorite parts of the day, about five out of the seven past days, um, but I didn't get to the writing it down part. And there have been times previously where I would have felt like I was a failure for not doing it, but I'm reminding myself that it takes time to get into a practice and my mom brain slash distracted slash, I don't know, probably semi ADHD ish brain is, has been on the search for the perfect planner so that I can write down all my to do's and gratitude and notes all in one place rather than having eight different notebooks all over the place. So reach out to me with your favorite planner recommendation at hello at momsietyclub.com or send me a message on social media. You can find the Momsiety Club and me at Momsiety Club, that's M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y Club on Instagram and Facebook. And if you don't have a planner recommendation, but just want to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. You can share a milestone your little one has reached or whatever you are struggling with right now in motherhood that you'd like to hear discussed on a future episode. I love hearing from you. Okay, on that note, I am super excited for what's to come in 2021 for the Momsiety Club. I hinted last week that there will be dedicated months for different causes or topics, and during 
those months, the cost of membership for all new moms who join the club will be donated to the specific charity for that month. And I just am so excited about this idea. I can't wait till next year to start donating. So for the month of December, the cost of membership for all new moms will be donated to the Children's Miracle Network. So you can join other moms in a supportive environment, plus know that you are helping out the Children's Miracle Network charity uh, all at once. So join other moms and become a member at join.momsietyclub.com. And a link is in the show notes for you. All right. Are you ready to learn about your baby's gross motor skill development? In this interview, Dr. Shannon PT gives moms recommendations on things to look for, to know if their child is working on hitting a milestone because there's such a range in ages for these developmental milestones. It's very broad. So here's some ways baby gear can help or also hinder your infant's development and learn about the little balance box, which she invented out of necessity as a mom of two. Here's a little bit more info about Dr. Shannon Davis, PT, DPT. She has over 14 years of providing specialized services to children and adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities in schools, day programs, and home settings. She's the CEO of Inspiration Physical Therapy, Inc., which provides therapy consultation services and Inspire Create LLC, which is the parent company of the Little Balance Box and this awesome hat that she also invented called Hattivity. She's a Move International trainer for adults and a certified autism specialist. She also participates in a variety of client advocacy activities at the local and state levels and philanthropic causes. Just a little housekeeping before we dive into the interview. Just as in previous episodes, anything that you may want to look up later is referenced in the show notes, links to um, Dr. Shannon PT's website and social media in the show notes. So you don't have to remember with your busy mom brain, or if you're in the middle of doing 20 different mom tasks, um, you don't have to take a note and remember to go Google it later. And Momsiety Club email subscribers, you get a link to the latest episode weekly where you can find all of these show notes as well. And if you're not already on the list, sign up for access to free resources, plus you get the emails about episodes at join.momsietyclub.com. Also a little reminder, make sure you hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. That way, you will automatically get the next episode downloaded to your phone since I'm guessing you're probably listening on your phone. All right, here is Dr. Shannon PT. Well, hi, Dr. Shannon PT. Thank you so much for joining me for the Momsiety Club podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Well, um, would you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your journey from PT, mom, business owner for little kids, and so on? Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Shannon PT. And so aside from being a physical therapist, I am a mom of two girls and it keeps me super busy, especially in this day and age with homeschooling. And so, um, yes, did a lot with physical therapy, kind of was going about my business. And then that's when just trying to solve life's little problems that I stumbled upon trying to make things better for my children and their development. So I've had quite the journey Um, like you mentioned, physical therapist by trade. So, you know, just love physical therapy and got into that business. Never thought that it would evolve to where I'm at today. Um, But it really just came from, you know, being a mom and trying to problem solve something that was going on in my everyday life. My husband was deployed. So I was at home with my two girls. And so at this point, I had, you know, um, a almost three-year-old and my almost one-year-old getting le- ready to learn how to walk. And 
you know, little sister always wanted to be after big sister and trying to keep up with her and see what she was doing. Um, little sister also wanted to be um, keeping up with the dog and just everything that was going on in the house. That was the activity, especially when my husband was away. They really just kind of played, you know, with each other and trying to entertain themselves, especially when I was trying to get dinner ready. You know, we had the different things around the house that people typically have to help children with walking. And so I was always getting frustrated because we have the carpet and tile floors. And so as I was watching all the time, my little one tried to get up and walk to chase her sister. She would always face plant with the different types of baby gear that we had in the house. And so that's where I kind of just had my aha moment as a mom and physical therapist of, you know, I'm not the only one who has multiple floor surfaces where there's these different change in the, the, um, the texture and the material of the floors and how quickly a child can walk with different baby gear. And so, you know, that's where it kind of just started for me having my background as a physical therapist and kind of a problem solver. But then, you know, that intuitive nature of us being moms of just trying to figure out how we can make things better and safer for our children. And not only that, how do I make my life easier that I didn't have to keep stopping cooking dinner to run over and pick her up every time after she would be falling with trying to walk? And so that was kind of the foundation that brought me to where I'm at with the development of the balance box and everything that has gone on um, since then. So this was obviously, like I said, not what I had ever dreamed I would be, Um, you know, went to school for physical therapy, had no formal education or background on fabrication, bring a product to market, safety testing, you know, e-commerce, selling globally. It's just been a whirlwind of stuff. And I think it really, one of the biggest things that I like to tell people, especially working moms is, you know, you can do it. Does it take a while? Yes, it did take me a while to do it. And, you know, some people said, you know, quit your day job, stop being a physical therapist, you know, so you can focus on product development and stuff like that. But I never wanted to give up what my ultimate passion is. And that's to help people, whether it be with a little balance box or still being a physical therapist. And so, you know, just trying to take those times as being a, you know, a mom and a um, professional woman and trying to balance those things that we all have to do every day, especially now with trying to, you know, still reach our own career goals while doing what we need to do to care, to care for our families. So that's kind of a little bit in a little diverted way there, a little bit of history of how I've kind of gotten to where I am um, with a little balance box. And, uh, like I said, it's been around now for a couple of years. So it's been wonderful to see the growth of it and not only the growth of it, but to now have, you know, parents who've used it with multiple children. And then they reach out to me and they're like, you know, hey, my kid was in swimming lessons. And the instructor said, commented on how, um, how strong they were with their core development and stuff as compared to the other kiddos in the swim class. And the parents will tell me, you know, we can attribute that back to, you know, how with the little balance box, how they were able to use that and really have a full body experience with helping with their growth and development. So it's those kinds of things that at the end of the day, make it so rewarding to know that, you know, it's not just about helping a child walk. I mean, this is having benefits for many years after in really helping the success of some of these children with their development. I like how that that you pointed that out, actually. Now, both my boys, completely different, but I can go, oh, he's not really that aware. And because I, I didn't know about it until after he was too old to have used it. And now that I used it with my youngest, I go, oh, he's much more coordinated. And I just go, well, the older one follows dad, the younger one follows me. So that's what, that's what, but never attributed it to using the little balance box. So now I will look at that more carefully. Well, and I can tell you, I have the exact same experience because my older daughter, didn't have a little balance box and she is different in her gross motor and how she moves and those kinds of things as compared to my younger one who was my trial and did everything with a balance box and was able to have that free mobility. And so even for me being a physical therapist and having the knowledge and stuff like that, the difference um, that I see in my own children and what they were exposed to. 
So another added benefit <laughs> for the little balance box. Um, but so I just want to go back a little bit quick since this is the Momsiety Club and I know your girls are older, um, but we just for the listeners, we met probably five years ago through some business uh, yes. trainings and things that we were in and we have stayed in touch and it's been wonderful to watch your journey and kind of just follow along um, and then also keep up with you uh, and your family. But I know you have shared a little bit. There are those mom anxiety times with your girls still. And I think that for everyone, we have to remember that those, those times change. So um, what do you do now that or if you're having mom anxiety, what are some of the things you do uh, to kind of calm yourself? Well, I don't think they ever, I mean, because even now, like you said, my my girls are older. I have a, a preteen and then still um, a younger child. But, you know, I still, we still have anxiety. There's still things, you know, it's just different. You know, at first when they were younger, it was, you know, were they developing correctly? Am I doing everything that I should be as a mom? And it, especially you know, today, good and bad, the world of social media, there's so much information out there. So on one hand, it can be super supportive because you, there's so much information at our fingertips now um, that we didn't have before. But on the flip side, we're already dealing with so much as moms that sometimes it can be very overwhelming to feel like, are we doing enough? Are we getting all the checks in the boxes? And even though my kids are, you know, a little bit older now, it, it doesn't change. I still have, you know, all of those things that, especially from a social perspective, you know, for mothers and stuff like that, what are we, what are we doing to make sure that we're doing all that we can? So um, I think I pretty much the biggest thing that I find when I start to like get overwhelmed, especially in regards to, to them is, you know, kind of do a little bit of self-reflection, like, okay, you know, I can't fix the world. I can't fix everything around them. What is the stuff that I truly have control over and that I can manage number one, like is what I'm trying to achieve realistic with my kids and with me being a mom. And then I think from there, it just makes it a little more manageable because then I really have like something, you know, maybe one or two things that I can address that I feel like I could then implement or make changes or something like that to, um, you know, address whatever it is that's going on. So that for me personally, helps a lot when I feel like something's more manageable and I'm not trying to like control a whole bunch of factors. And so from there, then I can just focus on those things of whatever it is that I need to do. But again, it's just, you know, really the self-reflection of, you know, am I doing the best that I really feel that I can do? And, you know, in what I'm doing for my daughters and I, we, you know, we don't have to be like everybody else, or we don't have to be doing all of this stuff. And I think, you know, once we kind of find that inner peace, with ourselves and what's manageable, it's important because that's what resonates with our children as well. Like, you know, do they see that we have that, you know, that we're always trying to fix things or, you know, problem solve and do things better, which is great, but is the stuff that we're trying to do realistic and that we are reaching goals because then that way it shows that there is success. And I think that's also important for our children, especially as they're starting to get older, to see that, you know, it, you just have to focus on some things so that way you can be successful. That That is a wonderful point with making sure that, yeah, the goals and seeing the successes throughout. Um, can I ask you one question that I did not send you? <laughs> sure. Um, just because I, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, as you were talking earlier about like when you were developing it, I forgot the back end story. Like I knew, I knew these things, but I forgot, oh yes, because your husband was deployed. And right now I have a few friends whose husbands are deployed and I'm kind of following them and seeing what they're, they're doing. But, and a lot of them have great support around them from other army families. Is that something mm -hmm. you had, or was there like a specific thing that you go to when your husband was deployed that was really helpful for te helpful to you? Um, for me, I think that that's where a lot of the, I didn't really necessarily, I mean, I was involved with like the local sub, you know, military spouses and stuff like that. So I attended those kinds of things and like networked and had um, people that I could connect with. But um, I think that one of just because of the type of personality and stuff that I am, I think that 
Um, my biggest thing to keep me occupied in missing him so much was really the development of the, you know, these products and learning and doing all of these things. And I, you know, if my husband was home, would I've probably done all this? I don't know because then he was home, but you know, that, that was what I used for an outlet was that I found something that, you know, when I did have the free time and stuff, I had a list of things that I was doing, I was researching. And so, um, that was my outlet, um, the different times that he was gone. I mean, my first kid, he was home for 10 days and he had to leave again. So I was really, um, by myself raising, um, both of my kids a a lot of the time. And so, um, that's how I utilized kind of my free time just to work on the product development. Um, I love how your brain works in that because I feel like that's why we click so well because that's how I am too. It's like, well, uh, I need to do something. So I'm going to make a huge project for myself to do. Well, and I think that's the thing too, you know, for sometimes for military spouses, um, you know, especially for people that are not in the military, you know, they don't necessarily understand kind of, you know, what we deal with or the relationships and stuff like that. And so um, I will say one of the biggest frustrations is when people would say to me, they're like, oh, you know, how, how is it that you can do that with your husband being away? Isn't it so tough? Like, aren't you depressed all the time? And I think, and I would say to them, I'm like, no, I'm like, we're doing fine. We have a, you know, me and my husband have a great relationship and, you know, he's doing what he needs to do for his job. And, you know, I'm working on things to make things better for children, like, and trying to make it a positive. And so that was another, you know, message really just trying to give people that, you know, everybody's situation is different. And, you know, just what you think of somebody, your situation or how you see my situation is not necessarily what it is. You know, I'm a type of person that, you know, I'm going to make the best out of it and use what I can to be positive. And so that's another thing that I know just in general for military spouses, um, that's sometimes hard for people to understand or relate to when they're not in that situation. That's a good point. And thank you for sharing that. Um, so with mom's anxiety, I know one of the huge things that can trigger that with new moms, especially first time new moms is, is my baby developing on target or things like that? I know the first six months, even as a experienced mom, we'll say, uh, is those six months are like, well, did the first one do this? Because you're, you're not doing anything. Like, aren't you supposed to be doing something right now? <laughs> Cause we forget how just their little, little blobs, kind of <laughs> little, <laughs> little adorable blobs who love to be loved on. Um, but so what is baby development things that really mom should be looking for? And do you see with, when you're seeing kids, are there things that you've read that are like being publicized in media in different things that really are not anything to be concerned over that can kind of cause uh, mom's anxiety for no reason? Um, well, I think, again, this goes back to um, a lot. We're just inundated today with the amount of information and timelines and everything on our baby's development. And so first and foremost, I always tell people, you know, babies develop at different rates. We know this. And it makes sense because there's so many things that need to happen from both a neurological, the muscle strength perspective, the endurance. Um, There's a lot of factors that need to come together for a baby to start working on their motor skills. And so when you think about all of these different systems on like a micro level and how rapidly they're developing and at different time frames, I mean, there's just a lot going on in these babies in that first six months of development. So it makes sense that it's not going to all happen at once and that everything, you know, needs to come together and coordinate for things to happen. And so there's going to be, you know, delays and there's going to be times where a child may be working on a gross motor skill and then it declines a little bit and then the parents might see it for, you know, see maybe a little bit of regression and then it comes back um, as far as some of the gross motor skills. And so all of those things are normal because there's so much going on within the foundation, the development of the baby. So the first thing that I just try to tell people is, you know, just be patient because there's a lot that has to go on for these things to even happen to begin with. 
So from that, of course, when you go to the doctor's office, they always have like the general, you know, guidelines and checklists, which are important because it gives you at least some kind of idea of, you know, when these skills should start to be emerging. And so that's what I tell people to kind of focus on is, okay, well, maybe you're not starting to see sitting yet, but do you have the foundational components that your baby's going to need for sitting? So for example, are they able to hold their head up? Are they starting to show that, you know, they have good core strength and um, mobility and stuff like that with like rolling, for example. So those are kind of the building blocks that you would need for sitting. So if your baby's at least demonstrating those things and you can see that they're start laying the foundation, then at least that also helps to um, alleviate some of the anxiety that, well, my, my child maybe not be sitting yet, but they're working toward it because they have these other foundational skills and, you know, that they're seeing with their body that's needed for them to be able to sit correctly. So that's another way to kind of look at things um, that maybe it's not just all about that getting that gross motor skill yet, but what are the other foundational or building block things that your child's working on to get there? And are they making those kinds of, um, you know, baby step (laughs) progresses to get where they need to be? So those are the big things, you know, to just try to look at. From there, then I would say, you know, if anybody ever has any concerns and there's a lot to be said about the mother's intuition, get checked out. It's always better to be proactive, especially in this day and age with how long it takes to get into doctor's appointments, if there's any issues with getting insurance coverage um, or getting approval for things, it's always better to be proactive. The worst that somebody can tell you is, nope, you're fine, go home. But at least you were proactive and you went in and you asked the questions and you know yourself that you then, you know, at least address any concerns to make sure that things were looked after. Now, are there times where people get turned away and they need to be more proactive because there really is something going on? Absolutely. But again, this goes back to you know, just kind of trusting your gut. And if things really aren't progressing, um, especially in maybe what you're seeing in relation to peers and stuff like that, then always seek any type of um, medical advice. So then that way, you you know, for sure. And, um, you know, really, that should be from the individual's actual medical provider. Because I know in this day and age, there's a lot of people out there giving advice and stuff on social media. The advice is wonderful, great suggestions, but it should never be used as a replacement for taking the time to just take your child to their actual medical provider who knows your child best to make sure that they get a hands-on assessment. Right. That Now, I would think this goes across the board, um, but I know where I am, we had both kids evaluated for different things. Ruben was for gross motor and... Uh, I kept asking and asking and asking. And then the doctor was like, yeah, okay, just, you know, do it. We'll see because he was on the later end of developing crawling and those things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we were proactive and things were great. And it, as it happens (laughs) is what the early intervention people said is, you know, it takes you several months to get the appointment. So by the time you have the evaluation, they generally are just starting to do what you were getting the evaluation for which is what happened there. And the same thing for my, for Eli, my youngest, the speech, exact same thing. And there, um, the doctor was also just, you know what, just do it in case I'd rather we check it out, which is really nice to have a doctor say, (laughs) definitely. Yes. Well, and the thing too, is that we have to understand with the child development, that first zero to three years, the brain is developing so rapidly. And so that's the, especially for gross, and I'll speak more to gross motor in particular for the first zero to 12 months is that gross motor is the foundation then for fine motor and for speech and language. And this makes sense, right? Because a child needs to really be able to sit before they're able to move their arm very well to be able to use their hand to do something such as self-feeding. But there's these episodes of development where the body is kind of utilizing all of their energy and resources to develop in this kind of sequential order. And so you have these optimum periods of development. And that's why it's so important, like you said, to be proactive because 
it takes so long to get these appointments. So if you're missing and you're not going in there until there's a full blown problem, and now you have to wait another six months, you're missing that opportunity for that optimum development. Will things still happen and change? Absolutely. Things, you know, can still, you get into therapy and you get your exercises and you do all that and you make progress. But the key point being that there was this period of optimization and that's what you're trying to maximize by getting in there early. And I don't want to send us down a whole nother tangential yes. road, but along those lines, again, just saying be proactive Yep. Um, early. I don't know if this is everywhere, but where we are, there seems to be like a pediatric therapy desert uh, where we cannot get in unless you're going through the early intervention or as for my older son, the school system. So it is like push, push, Very push, hard. push. Yeah. yeah. And try to do it as early as you would be concerned. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's very unfortunate. Maybe one day that would be one of the best areas of healthcare to have that be uniform in all the States, because that is a significant area that there shouldn't be different. Oh, sorry. That is the dog. <laughs> that is an area. It, 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 I mean, that is an area where there should be no differences between states. We're talking about children. They need the services. And yeah, we can, we can wish for that one day that all of the kids would have all of the same policies and accesses to resources in all of our states. Yes. Um, so you gave us some key tips for, you know, the timeline and the optimum development. Are there any things that parents should be doing to help with their baby's development in that first, like those first 12 months or first six months really to help optimize everything? Yes. So this has actually been um, kind of a a trending topic for the past couple of years, especially with me being involved with baby gear business and stuff like that. I mean, we are inundated with baby gear. There is baby gear out there to do everything for our children um, to help them in their development which is great. There's nothing wrong with that, having little support, but it's really important for people to understand how baby gear works and the differences of when you're using it and not using it in your child's development. And this has been a big area that, you know, just trying to provide a lot of education for parents. And, you know, there's not a right or wrong to this. We all have baby gear. I use baby gear when my kids were younger. Um, You know, it definitely serves a purpose. um, But again, it goes back to understanding. So what um, I would tell parents is, is first off, when you're utilizing the different pieces of equipment, understand, is it, you know, helping your kid? What type of things is it helping with their development? What types of things is it hindering with their development? Most importantly, how is it hindering the development? Why is that important? Because then you need to know how to offset it throughout their day to give them opportunity to practice what maybe they're not getting when they're utilizing baby gear. And um, it's important to note too, that all of these things add up, correct? Like we have to use a car seat for a baby. That's a non-negotiable, but that does restrain and restrict a baby's movement, which makes sense because they're in a car. We don't want them all over the place in the car. Then, you know, maybe you're using a high chair. Well, a high chair is important because you have to have your child sitting upright to eat so they don't choke. So there's non-negotiable baby gear that we have to use to help support our children. But then in the other times, instead of, you know, maybe using a seat to help the baby with their sitting skills, maybe that's a good time to put that over to the side and work on your child just sitting on the floor on a mat with maybe a couple of pillows and having more ability to move around, to sit up, kind of fall to their side, maybe then roll into a crawling position and get that free mobility. And so that's really the important take home message for parents um, in that zero to six month um, time frame is how much free mobility opportunity is your child getting throughout the day? Because you're adding up on a lot of the baby gear. So then how are you balancing that out by giving the opportunity for your child to freely move and practice their gross motor skills? Studies show on average, it takes about 3,000 repetitions to learn a new gross motor skill. And that is just an average. So for some children, it may take a longer, a little bit longer because of their processing um, to practice their gross motor skills. Depending on the complexity of the motor skill, it might take more repetition. 
So if you need to practice 3000 times, how are you looking at a child's daily schedule roughly to make sure that they're getting all those practice opportunities and refinement? Just like you and I, if we went to the gym and started lifting weights for the first time, it'd probably be a hot mess. I know it would be for me, <laughs> yeah. right? We have to practice or like going to a Zumba class or something like that, right? Usually right out the gate, we're not very skilled in picking up new skills like this, right? We have to practice a couple of times, get feedback, learn about it and finesse it. So then it looks pretty and we're able to do it correctly the next time when we do it after we practice and do some repetitions. The same thing is with our gross motor skills. We have to have the opportunity to practice. And again, because the kid's brain, the child's brain is developing so rapidly, there's only so much time because, you know, when they're getting to that 12, 11 month mark, their bodies and their minds are ready to start working on something else. So we really need to make sure in that first year, we're giving them that opportunity for repetition and practice when it's, when it's supposed to be done. Uh, I really like focused in on what you're saying, what is that baby gear doing to help them and what is it doing to hinder them? Because just especially now uh, with people working from home while their kids are at home or lack of daycare opportunities for younger kids, uh, like my best friend, she's going to be going back from maternity leave, but she's still working from home with her newborn three-month-old is what are the things that she is going to be able to have access to, to help her, but then, okay, recognize that and take those times throughout the day and say, okay, so you were just in this seat or whatever, we're going to flip you over and do these things because the seat hinders your, your, I would say trunk stability probably. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some great, a great way to look at, um, look at the tools you're using, um, which I think is not something that we normally do. We go, Oh, this is great. Oh, because they, um, because they're marketed as, yes. you know, this is, you know, eye catching bright colors, things spin, they can reach for this. Um, so, and that's exactly what I was going to say is that's where I feel like the industry has really done a disservice to the parents and caregivers that we should be providing with the product education about how it's limiting the child's development, but then also how they give recommendations of how we reverse that. And so that would be, you know, great if, you know, that was the education that was being presented on the unified front for parents and caregivers to really understand about, okay, if you're going to use this, this is how you, you need to balance it out. And, you know, I don't want parents to feel overwhelmed, especially totally can sympathize for people, you know, being at home, you know, trying to get work done and, you know, need to focus on work and keep a baby safe. So what I try to recommend is just try and pick parts of your day that are pretty consistent where you could um, work in the free mobility time. So maybe like before they're getting ready to eat, for example, like spend about, you know, 10, 15 minutes floor time or something before they're getting ready to have each meal or snack. That's a great way. I mean, the kids are always eating, always having a meal or snack. So then you can build in those opportunities that, okay, every time before they're going to get in their high chair, I know that they're going to go on the mat and have some free time. And um, that way it doesn't have to be over scheduled. It's kind of becomes just, you know, routine as part of, you know, something like that. Another good one to add it to is maybe after after a diaper change. Um, a lot of times kids are, you know, flat after a diaper change. Um, so, you know, put them in a safe place, maybe even just going into the, the crib, um, someplace safe to just move around in there. I mean, the crib is one of the best places. I mean, swaddling is a whole other topic we can talk about, um, especially when uh, swaddling, amen, fourth trimester. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I could have made it without <laughs> swaddling. But, um, you know, after that, the child needs to be able to move their arms and legs at night. Think about what a safe place that is when the child's resting for them to be able to stretch their legs, to be able to move and to practice these gross motor skills in a safe place. So um, again, obviously I could talk about this topic forever. Just, you know, it's things to think about. And I think all of us in, in the industry need to do a better job of helping caregivers and parents to understand this important balance. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing to help us understand. Definitely. Um, so now 
let's talk about the little balance box because you have invented this. This is to help with development uh, and you developed it out of need. Um, but when do you, when do you recommend it start being used? I think I posted when it was in my little, in my baby's room and it was my book holder and my little coffee table because he was too young to use it, but it was always there. It was present. So then when he started being able to, you know, push it around, actually probably big brother was the one who started playing with it first. And then he started playing Mm -hmm. with it and, and on and on. So what do you recommend? Tell us like the function of it. What makes it unique? Cause it has the breaks and all that stuff. <laughs> yes. The little balance box, we recommend, um, the best time to start using it is after a child has developed, um, a series of gross motor skills. So what I had found was, um, in the industry, people were recommending, um, push toy or seated Walker starting at like six, seven months of age. And like we just talked about earlier in the podcast, children develop at very different um, rates. And so to say print on a box that a child's ready for something at six months could be very different looking for a child. So what I recommend is when a child's starting independently pull to stand, they're able to roll in and out of sitting and then to a supine or either um, supine or prone position, which is laying on the stomach or laying on the back. And they're starting to lift their feet and starting to perform a little bit of single leg balance while they're holding on to something. So we provide this checklist um, both as a um, product information when somebody's looking to purchase a little balance box and we include it when you receive the balance box just to kind of review to make sure that your child is ready for the little balance box because the balance box isn't going to help your child walk unless they have these fundamental skills that they're ready. And so that's one of the great things too, is that there has to be a certain um, developmental foundation to be ready to use this. A child can't be forced because they don't have the strength or coordination yet. So that's the first thing that um, we um, do with our approach with a little balance box to make a little bit different, to really make sure that your child is ready from a developmental perspective. Then from that, um, it looks different from the other push toys for a lot of reasons, because I figured if I'm designing it from the ground up, it needs to be functional. And so that's one of the reasons why it looks so different from um, a lot of the other things on the market, because it is different. We went with a flat surface because this way a child has a lot of different place and space to put their hands or their forearms to allow them that transition to go from tall kneeling to standing. That's also why the little balance box is a little bit shorter as compared to other products, because we want your child to be able to transition from tall kneeling to standing and get that practice opportunity versus something that's a little bit taller. You're going to have to lift up your child to get to the handlebar. One of the other things that individuals don't realize is that as babies, they have something called the Palmer reflex grasp. And so what that is, is when you put something in a baby's hand, it automatically closes. That's just one of the primitive reflexes that's usually still um, intact up until sometimes 12 months of age. So why is this important to note? Well, if you put something in a baby's hand and they start to feel unsteady, they're starting to move fast, does the baby let go? No, they stay holding on to something because this primitive reflex is still intact. And so when a baby starts to feel unsteady, they don't understand or make the connection that what they're holding on to is giving them that unsteady feeling and that they need to let go. So with the flat surface, the baby doesn't have that going on as much because the hands are flat. And so they're not getting that feedback. So that's one of the things that went into developing the top surface with it being flat, clear, allows the babies to kind of see their feet, which is so important, you know, as a child development, we're working on teaching them all these parts of their body. So we want them to still see all the parts of their body and what's going on with it. The top has a cool little percussive sound. So when you tap on it, it makes a little drum sound, nothing crazy, no lights, no bells, no batteries, just kept it simple. Um, We went with, you know, bamboo, eco-friendly kind of approach. Um, Again, you know, figuring if I'm making it, what would I want for health and safety in my house and aesthetics as, as well. Now the feet, what's a little bit different about the feet is there's springs in them. 
So most push toys have wheels and that's what everybody's used to seeing is wheels. And so with the wheels, they end up having a lot of variability between carpet and towel or wood surfaces. We have springs in the feet. So what happens is, is as the child pushes down on the top surface, the springs compress, giving it more stability and helping to create more of a drag mechanism to help give the balance box a little more resistance when they're walking on faster moving floors. The springs also help with that neurological development because it gives their bodies and their brains information with a little bit of the, the springy feel. So it also helps really kind of wake up their systems as well when they're using it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, some of the stuff that we thought about. And then, of course, it can be used as a toddler table when they get a little bit older. So, you know, I call it more of a lifestyle piece versus, you know, just buying something that's only going to last a couple months. Um, my kids, I mean, because, of course, we have lots of balance boxes around here. Um, they make excellent Lego tables. So oh, even perfect. my... Yes. Even my kids, you know, they use them as toddlers. It's a great little snack table, easy to clean. They push their, you know, stuff around their snacks and they could just sit down um, because toddlers have a really hard time getting on and off chairs. They tend to tip chairs. So this is perfect because you can just sit on the floor and pull the balance box over great little um, tabletop surface for a toddler. But like I said, even now my, uh, my older kids, um, we still use them for our Lego tables because there's nothing worse than tramping on Legos. <laughs> And so the little balance box, it keeps them all in place and um, is a great way to, you know, keep all of those um, kinds of activities and stuff. Even as they get older, they can still use it. That, that is great. I'm going to have to suggest that because I just, what, before, before we started the call, I had just told uh, Shannon that my youngest just picked up the little balance box the other day and <laughs> pushed it because he needed a stool. Um, and I said, no, that's not your stool, but where its home was prior to that was right next to the Legos that were up on something else. And I think that was kind of keeping him from getting to the, to, to my older son's Legos. <laughs> but now I'll say, okay, Ruben, you'd use the Legos on this. <laughs> Yeah, no, it works great because especially when they, you know, want to, you know, do something and then having to try and clean it up and stuff. And then they work so hard on assembling mm -hmm. the Legos and they don't want to put them back in the thing. It's a great way for them to have their own little, own little nice flat surface for Lego building. Yes. And also he, Ruben is six. He's still like a week ago was playing with the little bounce box, like pushing on it with the springs and like walking. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm using the little balance box. Okay, have fun. <laughs> but this, the feel of the springs never get old. I have to tell you, even when I do trade shows, it yeah. cracks me up. I will have parents, they're like, what's in this? And I'm like, oh, feel it. And then all of a sudden they're on their knees and they're crawling around exhibit halls with a balance <laughs> box. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, but it just feels so neat. I'm like, well, that's why the kids like it. Right. And I do have to say there are many times when uh, yes, Eli started doing the knee walk with it and went to the standing up. And there are many times when my husband was like, uh, he's going, that's going to fall and he's going to like fly. And I was like, no, that's the beauty of it. It has like this breaking mechanism in it. <laughs> you just trust it. Yep. <laughs> yes. And we've been good with it. So thank you for, uh, the little balance box and how I've gotten to now experience it, uh, as a parent. Um, but tell me, tell us please where we can find the little balance box. Most people just prefer to go to the Amazon, um, just because that way they can get it quicker. I mean, even though we ship out two day shipping, um, because we, um, the way we sell on Amazon, sometimes people can get them the same day. Okay. So either option, um, you can go for our website or you can go to Amazon. Either way, if you just type in little balance box, you can pretty much find it anywhere. It'll come right up on Google for you and where to get it. Great. And where can listeners follow you on social media? Um, our social media is under Inspira Spark, I N S P I R A S P A R K. So a lot of people, especially if you've known me for some time, we started off with a little balance box, but of course, being a mom inventor and after going through this, and as my daughters got older, I realized that we needed another product, which is Hattivity, our interactive headwear for children. And so um, 
we are now trying to really just make sure everybody understands that we are the Inspire Spark is actually the brand for for both of our products. And so um, Inspire Spark is the brand and we um, consider ourselves we are more natural toys for brilliant children because we like to really um, make sure that we are doing what we can to help with the development of, um, you know, really making sure that we're doing the best we can for our children and the products that we're manufacturing and offering to them. And the Hattivity uh, hat is awesome because it's, you get to, your child can change what their hat looks like from minute to minute. And yes. it's really, that's, that's really great as well. And they're cute and they're huge wide brimmed. My only problem is that Ruben demanded on wearing it in the pool. And I was like, this is not a pool hat. <laughs> Just, and I was like, just so you know, you, you can, it, it's water resistant. I mean, obviously we don't, it's not waterproof, but I will tell you, my kids wear them in the ocean and the pool and the patches and everything in the sands yes. and they hold up pretty well. Yeah, they do I hold was up. Surprised. They do hold up. It's just, you know, sometimes he gets, yes. you know, about the wet hat then. And I'm like, well, you, you chose to wear it in the pool. <laughs> what am I yes. going to tell you? <laughs> That, yeah, no, it, it, yes. When you come out, it is not going to be dry. Like when you went in, <laughs> it right. doesn't dry out that quick. Right. Yeah, that's been, that's been one of the, 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 um, it's just been crazy with the, the activity and stuff like that as well with, we had the summer hat now we have the winter hat and just allowing kids that opportunity to, um, you know, have a choice in there, especially for sun protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, with me living here in SoCal, it's so frustrating trying to put sunblock on just to run to the store and stuff. So hats were a lifesaver um, for us. And we obviously all still wear them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a whole another yes. topic of how yes. that got came to life. <laughs> um, but can you tell us now, this is something I do with all uh, guests, uh, is what is something you've done for yourself today or this week? Because we have to kind of find those little moments of self-care throughout the day. My big self-care is yoga. Um, probably about uh, four years ago, um, I, I, I had always done it on and off, but probably about four years ago, I really um, dove into yoga and that has been kind of my just go-to all the time because I can do it any place, anywhere. I can be in a meeting, you know, especially nowadays with being on Zoom calls and stuff like that, turn off my camera for a minute, do a couple stretches, um, you know, especially for being on the computer and stuff like that. So that, um, that has been my go-to is usually yoga. And I use a lot of essential oils with just aromatherapy. I think those are a great way to, you know, go out. Some of those oils are expensive. Treat yourself, go buy some of those really good oils that have a really nice blend to them that when you're just having a rough moment, you know, put that in. And it's amazing the difference of just having um, something like that, that can really, you know, brighten your day and change your affect. I love those tips. And so now I know your girls again are older than <laughs> my boys, but now looking back, is there something you wish you would have told yourself as a new mom that kind of would have helped you, uh, helped you along? I don't know. I think everybody, you know, there's definitely the, the, um, conceptions about, you know, first time in, in new moms and being a little bit more, um, I don't want to use the term uptight, but I can't think of what other word to use versus when you have a second, you know, a second child, which is true. I experienced it. And I think that, you know, looking back, I wish I was a little bit more relaxed with the first one, just because I think I would have been, um, you know, just about the timing and the relationship and the experience that, you know, it, if we just step back a little bit, take a breath, we're doing a good job and enjoy the moment instead of being so worried about, you know, was I doing things the right way? Um, I think that would have been one of the things that I really wish I would have kind of listened to myself and to, you know, whatever, you know, everybody's always giving you your advice, especially with the first kid. But I think that that's one, if I would have just, you know, relaxed a little bit more, especially seeing the difference in myself and my personality with the second child, um, would have been nice if I really would have listened to that with the first. Sorry, that yeah. was really long. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I love, you know, you just relax and enjoy the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's great advice. But I want to thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge with us and telling us all about 
you and Little Balance Box, and I will put links to Inspire Sparks and as well as Little Balance Box uh, on Amazon in the show notes and links on how to find you and your company. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, it was wonderful talking with Shannon, learning about gross motor development and hearing from someone with kids a little older than mine um, about how mom anxiety evolves as the kids get older. Do you have any further questions or want to share about your child's developmental milestones that they're hitting? I would love to give you a shout out on a future episode. Head over to Instagram and check out some of the pictures too and stories this week where I'll be sharing some photos of my little guy cruising around and loving his little balance box. And if you are still in search of a holiday gift, definitely check it out. And you can get the link in the show notes for that. All right. Well, that is the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to get the latest episodes Download it to your phone and share the podcast with a mom friend. Head to join.momsietyclub.com to sign up for free resources for new and not so new moms. Find information about the Momsiety Club membership and a special year end sale going on right now to work one on one with me about movement and mindset so you can get in that realistic self care time, not to mention a little human interaction with an adult who lives outside of your household. All right, Mama. Thanks for listening. Now, let's go get rid of this momsiety together. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.